Up next, a woman mysteriously disappears. We called her Thursday, we called her Friday, no answer. She vanished out of nowhere. Detectives check her apartment, but someone's been there before them. Obviously, someone's been watching CSI. He knew we were coming. He knew what he was doing. A suspect emerges, but he isn't talking. He was hiding out to sustain himself. And if police can't find the victim, they'll have a hard time proving murder. Sunday services at the Golden Gate Church in Fort Worth, Texas, were an important part of Glenda Furch's life. My mother has attended the same church since she was born. Her grandmother attended that church. Her mother's mother is a generation church, so it's very important. Hey, my name is Glenda. So when Glenda didn't show up for services one Sunday morning, family and church members suspected something was wrong. Her pastor said that even if she didn't go to church on a Sunday, she would call him to apologize for not going to church. We had been calling her and calling her, no answer. So one of Glenda's daughters went to her apartment. The first thing she noticed was that her mother's car was missing. The apartment door was locked. Glenda wasn't there. But the apartment was stiflingly hot. The AC had been turned off or turned down. So it was very, very hot in there. And that was not like mom to not have any air on in the apartment. Hey, mom. Glenda's daughter assumed her mother had gone somewhere for a few days. So she locked the door and left. The next day, when Glenda didn't show up for work, her family called police to report her missing. When police arrived, they noticed the air conditioning had now been turned on, and they found unmistakable signs of foul play. There was a very large bleach stain on her carpet next to her bed in her master bedroom. Glenda's daughter told police she didn't smell bleach the day before. There had been some extensive cleaning done, and there were some items missing from the apartment, such as the vacuum cleaner, the trash cans. Forensic testing of the stain on the bedroom carpet turned up nothing except bleach. We never found any positive signs of any signs of blood. And someone had also wiped down the doorknobs, light switches, and water faucets to remove fingerprints. But where was Glenda Furch? We were still holding that hope, yeah. You don't give up, you don't, you don't lose the hope. Glenda's employer, General Motors, said she was at work on Thursday night and left the factory around midnight. And records showed Glenda used her credit card to buy gas a short time later at 12.24 a.m. We know that she went and purchased gas because that was the last transaction of her, on her credit card. But no one saw or heard from her after that and no one could tell police anything about Glenda's personal life. She kept her personal life very private. No one in her family could give us the name of who, if anyone, she might be dating. But a check of police records showed Glenda called 911 a few weeks earlier, saying she felt threatened. Forward, police operator L450, how can I help you? By lighting these candles in unity, we are sharing hope and faith. 51-year-old Glenda Furch was missing, and Fort Worth investigators feared she had been the victim of foul play. This is a woman just going home from work who had never really done anything wrong. She'd never been engaged in questionable activity, and she vanished out of nowhere. Glenda's life revolved around her job at General Motors, her two daughters, and her grandchildren. She liked to do a little traveling. I love being with the grandchildren, church and shopping like most ladies, and being with her family. That was very important to her. In a search for suspects, investigators learned that Glenda Furch called police several weeks before her disappearance to report some criminal activity. 
I just wanted to report last week this guy knocked on my door. When I asked who was it, he just went the rambling off about something he had to show me. I said, no, I'm not interested. And he said, oh, just give me a chance. Just give me a chance, you know, and he just stood there begging mm -hmm. for me to open my door. At the time, there were a number of home invasions in the city of Fort Worth where robbers would knock on doors or just kick them down. But none of the homes were cleaned after they were robbed, so investigators concluded there was no connection between the robberies and Glenda's disappearance. That's when Glenda's neighbors gave police some key information. We found two young men who were moving into a nearby apartment right across from hers that earlier that morning, Monday morning at about two in the morning, had seen a black male coming back and forth from the direction of her apartment to a car parked right across from her apartment. That car fit the description of Glenda's gold-colored Mazda. Another neighbor described the same man repeatedly driving a gold Mazda in and out of the parking lot on Sunday night. And early Monday morning, yet another neighbor saw a man fitting the same description leaving Glenda's apartment. This witness told investigators that the individual that they'd seen coming in and out of the apartment may have been going to the dumpster. For him to be able to come and go for several days or for even for a length of time like he did, I think that can suggest that he was not only familiar with the area, he may have possibly lived there at some time. Evidence technicians emptied the dumpster and went through the contents of dozens of bags. Five of the bags contained items taken from Glenda's apartment. If the family had to wait until Tuesday instead of Monday to call us, and the dumpster would have was empty Tuesday morning early, and there goes all of our evidence. In one bag was the receipt for the gas Glenda purchased on Thursday night after work. This proved Glenda was home for at least part of Thursday evening. We all felt like we hit the mother load of evidence when we got all the things out of the dumpster that we did. The bag also held empty drink cans and cleaning products, including an empty gallon container of bleach. Another bag contained one of Glenda's blouses, slit all the way up the back. When you see the clothing cut, you start thinking possibly sexual assault. One of the lieutenants on the case initially said, Darla, we don't know what this is, but it's going to be very bad. Also in the garbage, investigators found another clue. We found duct tape, used duct tape, as well as duct tape still on a roll. And we found some electrical cords that had been wrapped up, uh, tied up into knots, and uh, other items that looked like they had been involved in a crime. It looked as if someone had used the duct tape and cords to restrain Glenda. Our worst fears were being realized. The only fingerprints found in Glenda's apartment were Glenda's. Her prints were on file with the police department when she filed an application for a gun permit. That gun was missing from her apartment. Veteran detectives were surprised at how much effort had gone into cleaning Glenda's apartment. It appeared to have been wiped down. On your mirrors in your bathroom, those are great places to get fingerprints. There was not even a smudge mark. Obviously, someone's been watching CSI. They vacuumed thoroughly, I assume to try to collect any hair or fibers that might be present. And apparently, whoever used the vacuum cleaner took it with him. We just need to know what happened. So if anybody knows anything, we're just pleading to the community to, today it's me, tomorrow it could be you. Five days after Glenda's disappearance, someone called police to report a fire at a car wash 30 miles from Glenda's apartment. It looks like a fire is on fire right now. On fire? Stay on the line, sir. I'm connecting you with the fire department. Fire officials arrived to find a gold-colored Mazda engulfed in flames. 
Accelerants had been used and the fire had been deliberately set. When the vehicle fire was extinguished, investigators found no one inside. The license plates had been removed, but the vehicle identification number was still intact. It was Glenda Furch's car. While they were doing their investigation, we, I guess we, we were doing our own little investigation, trying to find out what happened. We were putting out flyers in neighborhoods. We were talking to media people. Then, a citizen reported finding a female body wrapped in a blue floral comforter tied with electrical cords along the railroad tracks within the Arlington city limits. At that moment, there was no doubt in my mind that we had recovered Glenda's body. But it was not to be. A forensic odontologist compared Glenda's dental records to the unknown female, and it wasn't Glenda. That news was rather shocking. How many black females tied with electrical cord, wrapped in blue floral comforters can there be? Uh, the answer to that was obviously more than one. So the search continued. One month after Glenda Furch's disappearance, Dallas police noticed a man getting items out of the trunk of a car that had been reported stolen. As police moved in, the suspect took off and led them on a high-speed chase. He drove the vehicle through a couple of stoplights, had a couple of narrow misses, and then he got on the freeways, and the officers told us that, that he got that vehicle traveling faster than they ever thought a Ford probe could move. A very lengthy pursuit ensued, and the car wrecked out. And they took a young man into custody for fleeing from the police and for driving a stolen car. The carjacker was 40-year-old Rodney Owens, an unemployed career criminal. Rodney had a dishonorable discharge from the military. He had assaulted his commanding officer, which is not a good thing. A background check revealed Owens had numerous warrants out for his arrest for aggravated assault charges involving his ex-girlfriend. Owens' ex-girlfriend told police Owens had threatened to kill her. He told her that he could come up behind her and put a plastic bag over her head and watch her die. She also said Owens had recently been stalking her and she and her co-workers saw him driving a gold-colored Mazda similar to Glenda's car around the time of Glenda's disappearance. Investigators also learned that Owens once lived in Glenda Furch's apartment complex with his mother. The front of her apartment looked right out directly at Miss Furch's apartment. Then, investigators noticed something else. When police searched the car Owens was driving in the high-speed chase, they found a bag containing a roll of Tape-It brand duct tape. This isn't a common brand. It's sold only in a handful of stores in the Fort Worth area, but it was the same brand duct tape used to bind Glenda Furch. And it also contained a handgun, a hunting knife, some electrical cord that had been tied in knots. Investigators wondered if any of the other items in Owen's bag matched items found in the dumpster outside Glenda's apartment. So they sent all of the evidence to the forensic lab. There, scientists noticed a similarity in the electrical cord found in Owen's car. The same type of knots and the same type of cord that were found in the dumpster outside Glenda Furcher's apartment. They sent us a number of different items, including swabs that were reportedly from cans, as well as cuttings from towels and scrapings from clothing. The swabs from the drink cans were found to contain saliva. Also, on one of the cans was a partial fingerprint. Using super glue fuming and ninhydrin, they found 
another partial print on the cardboard spool of the used duct tape found in the trash. After the print is developed with an anhydrine and the super glue, then those prints can be photographed. The print that was photographed off the roll of duct tape, I had an enlargement of an enhanced version, and I compared it to an enlarged photograph of Mr. Owen's prints. That print on the roll of duct tape was made by Mr. Owens. They also found what appeared to be biological evidence on a bath towel that looked like the towels in Glenda's apartment. The biological evidence was semen. The DNA profile from the bath towel and saliva from the drink were compared to Rodney Owens. There was no surprise. The profiles from the soda cans were identical to the profile I obtained from Rodney Owens. The profile I obtained from the sperm fraction of the towel was identical to the profile I obtained from Rodney Owens. Rodney Owens was arrested and charged with Glenda Furch's murder. But would Owens reveal what he did with Glenda's body? While in custody awaiting trial for Glenda Furch's murder, Rodney Owens fell victim to boredom and let his guard down in a conversation with another prisoner. The suspect told another inmate in jail that he knew that this lady lived alone, that she worked at GM and worked a late shift. He knew she drove a nice car, and uh, he was pretty certain she would have money. Prosecutors know that Rodney Owens was living in an apartment across from Glenda Furch's, and he knew Glenda's work schedule and habits. On the night of the crime, as Glenda pulled into the parking lot, prosecutors think Owens used a weapon to force Glenda into her apartment. The evidence shows he used duct tape and electrical cords to bind her. And then he sexually assaulted her and killed her. He stole whatever cash and valuables he could find. He then wrapped Glenda's body in bed sheets and placed it in her car. Where he took her body, no one knows. <clears throat> Glenda's daughter stopped in to check on her mother on Sunday. Owens returned on Sunday night and spent hours cleaning the apartment, wiping away the fingerprints, and using the vacuum cleaner to remove hair and fibers. He later took the vacuum with him. Owens threw away most of the items he used in the crime in the dumpster, but he left partial prints on a piece of duct tape and a drink can. He also left his DNA on the drink can and biological evidence on a bath towel, later found by investigators. In the days after the murder, Owen's ex-girlfriend said he was driving a car identical to Glenda's and even used it to stop by her workplace. By the time Owen set fire to Glenda's car, He'd already left plenty of evidence of his involvement in the dumpster outside Glenda's apartment. We still don't know exactly how Glenda Furch died, but that one fingerprint, the few specimens of blood and semen put this case together. It was enough to know that something bad had happened. Something sexual happened in that apartment, but I can't substantiate a sexual assault. You've taken away a mother, a grandmother, somebody's child, and it's not fair. The defense hung its case on the fact that there was no body, that they still couldn't prove that Glenda Furch was dead. But witness after witness testified that Glenda Furch would never just leave her family, her church, and her job. And Owens had a very simple motive. He needed money. He had a nonviolent criminal past, but after he had nowhere to live and no body to support him, he escalated into violence. 
And would you rise and read that verdict, please, sir? We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. One year after Glenda Furt disappeared, Rodney Owens was convicted of her murder and sentenced to life in prison. He was offered a lighter sentence in return for disclosing where he took Glenda's remains, but he refused. The most difficult part is the unknown, not knowing, exactly, not knowing. So still today, we don't know, and it's the unknown. So it's still very difficult. It was a web. You had the items that were found in the dumpster, his DNA combined with Furch's items. It was a very intricate, intricate web that would never could have been put together without the forensics in this case. I wasn't familiar with forensic science. I knew a little bit, you know, you watch TV, you, you know, but I wasn't real familiar with it. But learning, going through this process with the, with the DA, with the detectives, I've learned a lot more that forensic science is incredible.